everybody. Good morning, everybody. If we just take a, a second to settle, and if anyone else in the foyer wants to, wants to begin to make their way in. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to, to Bethany this morning. Uh, I welcome whether you're, you're here in person or whether you're watching uh, live on YouTube now or, or maybe joining us on, on Catch Up later. Um, as you may have guessed from the start, if you're watching on YouTube, it's a, it's a lively Bethany this morning. And it's one of the things we pride ourselves on, of, of a family feeling and a, a gathering together of people catching up uh, and meeting uh, with each other. And then we, we spend our time now gathered in the presence of the Lord. So I welcome you all here this morning. Um, this is on our guest service, and so it's a service once a month where we, we gather together and we, we meet a, a little differently. We're normally relatively informal as a church, but uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you may have seen when the, the camera panned out that many people are sat uh, around tables rather than in traditional rows uh, looking forward. And those tables are, are there for a reason, because as we, as we go through um, our, our meeting today, uh, obviously I'm going to be speaking, there's going to be different people up here at different times, but also Bethany's not a spectator sport. Um, we're going to be, be throwing things out for, for you to discuss around tables, and if you, you're doing that at home and you're with other people, I'd really like you to, to spend the time and discuss things in your own house as well. So for our, our guest services, we've been working through uh, a theme of restoration, and this week's theme is To the One Who Knocks. It will be open, which will be from a passage that many of you will be familiar with. Uh, I think originally this series was actually from, from a calendar that, that Alan Garner's uh, mum received. So we, we very much uh, thank her for, for giving us this idea as we've gone through the year. And I think we've been blessed so far by the topics that we've had. And, and we trust that we will be as we continue through into the year. Now for today's theme of uh, Knock uh, and It Will Be Open, we have some crafts for the kids. Here's one Samuel prepared earlier. If you can see that, that's a door. Uh, it's one he knocked together in between games of Minecraft uh, yesterday, I think it was. And uh, for, for the others, there's also uh, some puzzles on the tables. The puzzles are, are mainly for the children, but there's quite a few, and I'm sure if any of the adults want to do some word searches, uh, you can probably take those away uh, later as well. Okay, before we begin, we just have a, a few dates uh, for our diary. Um, next week, um, we're continuing, well, actually, we're not continuing, we have our um, our Father's Day service, of which the last few years we've given it the theme of our Heavenly Father, and we've asked the, uh, the speaker to, to bring uh, a message on that theme to us uh, each year. And Peter McGrath is our, our speaker next week, who again will be, be known to, to many of you and will be a friend to, to many of you as well. And we encourage the, the fathers uh, to join us in particular that day, and I'm sure there'll be a, a small gift as you, you enter into uh, uh, our service. And then the week after, we, can, we return to our um, Sermon on the Mount theme, and our speaker then will be John Hayes. There's a few other dates to, to bring to you, and I, I think um, everyone will know about uh, our dear sister Eileen uh, died uh, just over a week ago, I think it was now. So we have the funeral arrangements for Monday, 27th of June, 12 noon, uh, at Landican. And there will be a service here at 1 p.m., uh, for Thanksgiving, for, for Eileen, Eileen's life, Eileen, again, was a, a friend to many, and she was, uh, she was a jovial character, in fact, very much a character uh, known to, to many of us here. And that service will be led by, by Simon and Mal. There's also uh, a further funeral service that Bethany are involved in, which is for, for Grace Gooding, and I think she'd know, be known particularly for uh, many of the ladies here at Bethany. Uh, I understand that she's been through um, After Eight and the Ladies' Fellowship over many, many years, and her two sons also came through JUCOs and Covenanters, um, and the, the family have contacted us regarding uh, the funeral service. That will be led by, by John Fletcher. At the moment, the service is at Landican at 11.30 uh, a.m. on Wednesday, the 29th of June, so a couple of days after Eileen's funeral. And if, if you knew Grace, uh, or, um, I'd, we'd like you to encourage you to go to, to that service as well. The, the family have reached out to Bethany for that. I'd like you to pray for, for both families and friends of those who mourn uh, for both, both of them. Okay, if we begin our, our service and just bow our heads for a moment. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've gathered us here together again. We take your promise that, that where two or three of us are, are gathered together, you are, are here with us, and we, we sense that uh, throughout our time at Bethany, and we thank you for the many wonderful things that you've done in, in the lives of people here, 
um, that you've done through this church. And we just pray that, that you'll continue to do that in our lives, that as we leave the service today, we'll have understood a little bit more about you. And we pray for an enjoyable time of our fellowship together, and we could hear the, the, the hubble bubble of noise as we gathered together uh, this morning before the service. And as we, we gather for a social time after this service, we pray this, that we'll, we'll have a sense of, of your, fee, your presence with us through the service and through our time together here. We, we pray also that you'll, you'll bring us together as a church and, and help us to be united. And maybe people will make more friends, uh, closer friends, as the service uh, comes to, to an end. And we pray also for um, Rebecca and um, Charlie, uh, Rebecca Curl, who, who married yesterday. Uh, and we pray for your blessing on their marriage as they enter into it now. And we, we pray that, that you'll bless the, the union together and also little Nathaniel. And we, we look ahead and we pray for support for that family as they go ahead. And we pray finally for, for the message that we hear today, Lord. We, we sometimes hear different things and we pray that there'll be, we'll, we'll each hear what you want us to hear and to take away from this service today. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Now, Bethany, we often ask you to, to pray for things and we tell you about things that, that people are involved in. And one of the things we've been asking about for the last few months is about MCYC and camp. I know many of you uh, have been to MCYC as campers and leaders in the past. In fact, if anyone has, if you want to put your hand up, and that's a, a show to, to all the people. Who's been as a camper or leader uh, to camp before? So I think that's probably about uh, half the people in the room. And it's something that's talked about very much at, at Bethany. Um, and over the last few weeks, we, we've announced people going to camp. Uh, and also uh, had some prayer sheets that we asked you to take away. So just over a week ago, uh, four of us went to, to junior week at MCYC. It's the first camp uh, of the year. Uh, and I went as a leader. Um, the twins, uh, Jacob and Nicole, went as first-time campers. And also uh, Jackie Blackburn came uh, in the cookhouse as well. The Sterling service was done in the cookhouse. I wanted to bring you uh, a few postcards from Patheli as I've called them, as I want you to see what you were praying for and what happened at camp. So here's just a few pictures uh, from junior week. I can't show you any of the other campers uh, who weren't from Bethany, uh, if you'll understand that, but there will be some pictures coming out afterwards, and there's some excellent drone footage they took if tech's your thing. Okay, so in my mind, this is what camp always looks like. And when I arrived at camp, this, is, this genuinely is what the Saturday afternoon looked like. It was absolutely beautiful at camp. Uh, now, I know a lot of you prayed for the weather. It can make a big difference to camp. I'm sure many of us have, have been at camp when it's rained for a few days, and it can be particularly difficult. And I, it really felt as if this was God's blessing on this. We had the, the youngest week of campers, ages 8 to 11. And because of lockdown and camp not taking place for the last couple of years, almost all of the campers were first-time campers. The only ones who will have ever been before were eight last time round. And then they were now the, the oldest uh, stages at 11. So it was a real blessing for camp to begin uh, with such glorious weather. Uh, kids, most of the whom it was the first time they'd been away from home, certainly without their parents. And so we, we were joined by a glorious week. And even when there was a little bit of rain in the air, I took this beautiful picture here. You can see the rainbow in the background. So we were blessed with, with uh, wonderful weather through the whole week. So thank you if you were praying for that. It really did make a difference to us at camp. Now, through the week, there's a spiritual program, and we were really blessed by the Padres and the messages uh, that they brought to us. And, you know, for those who were praying for the spiritual lives of the children, about 10 of the campers made commitments. And so it really was a, a blessed week at camp. There were about 63 campers. Uh, the boys were in these tents. The girls were in the chalets. I have to say, as a leader, the first, the first morning was a, a particular shock. I'd forgotten quite how early the kids get up on the first morning. Um, <laughs> When you're in Wales, and at this time of year, I think it becomes daylight at about 4.15 a.m. Um, and on the first day, most of the boys saw that as a sign to get up. So most of them were up at 4.30 in the morning. And uh, there was a full-scale football match going on by about 5.30 in the morning. Uh, all I'll say is that they didn't manage that on the second morning. But, but there we go. But it was a glorious week at camp. And just over that hedge there is the, is the boys' football pitch, which is a, a place which uh, has fond memories for me. Uh, I move a little slower on there now than I did when I was a child, but I still try and, uh, try and grace that field there. Um, so many activities that go on through the week. Um, I think most will know from camp the first day, or the, the first um, full day, we go to Patheli Beach. And there's Nicole down on Patheli Beach. You can see again the weather behind us there. Uh, we could tell most of them were first-time campers because about three-quarters of them volunteered to go into the sea. Now, 
I don't know about you, but the idea of the sea off the coast of Wales in May, um, you know, when the more experienced campers, you realize only about a quarter of them do, and they tend to be the newer campers. But about three quarters of them went in. About a third of those campers put their feet in the water and then turned around and came back again. <laughs> but quite a lot of hardy campers did stay in the water, and amongst those were Nicole and Jacob. Uh, and then you can see the, another day of glorious weather. Those Jacob played table tennis. There was a day of activities when they moved from activity to activity. And it was a great time for them to make friends. There were kids there um, from churches with lots of kids, but there were also kids from churches who had very few. And you can't underestimate um, um, what the difference it makes for them to, to see how many other kids there are who go to church and are Christians um, from other churches around them. Uh, again, there, there's Jackie. You'd never believe how many times we had to retake that picture until Jackie was satisfied with it. But, uh, but she's not here this morning, so I can say that. I know you'll be watching this, Jackie, and you can get me next week. Uh, but the cookhouse really did do sterling service, and the whole place only works because so many people so, put so much hard work into it, and so many things have to go right, and your prayers really do count towards this. So few things went wrong on this camp, and even the things that did go wrong we were able to deal with uh, very, very straightforwardly. So we really do thank you for that. And you can see uh, Jacob and Nicole, the by now experienced campers, I think this was about day four, feeling relaxed in their surroundings and really enjoying the, their time at camp. There's one person who hasn't featured in these pictures yet, and here's me with my Go Faster stripes on. <laughs> there you go. And for those who've been a leader, what you know is that the sports day is the most active day, very, very active day, and it ends with, um, it ends with a massive water fight where most of the time uh, the campers are mainly concerned about getting the leaders, and then we go down uh, a massive water slide. So uh, if any of you want to ask Jacob and Nicole how it was at the end, they'd be delighted to tell you how it went. But it doesn't end there. There are camps that are going to continue uh, throughout the summer. Um, again, there are many campers who haven't been before because it hasn't gone on for the last couple of years. And there are many campers and also leaders as well who are rusty uh, with the arrangements as to how it all works. We've got a big group going to Inters A, which is at the end of July. And I think we've also got a couple going to Seniors. If anyone wants to shout if there's any other weeks people are going to. Um, but if you want to pray for those, there are leaflets outside um, that look like this. And it gives you the, the dates of the weeks. And as those camps come up, we'll tell you about the kids and the leaders that we have going to those. And we really pray for um, their physical safety, but also that God will shine through in those camps and the people will hear and learn about him. There's also Camp Praise, which is taking place now. For those already associated with Camp, it's a praise, um, or MCYC Live, as it's now called, to, to praise the work of camp, but also to work as uh, as a reunion for those who've been as, ca as campers. And the next one is next uh, Saturday at Hoylake, uh, 7 o'clock for 7.30. So I just encourage that. For those campers and leaders who've just been to Junior Week, uh, it's going to be a good reunion for them to be gathering uh, together. Okay, so uh, back to our theme. Uh, to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Now, um, we're going to have a, a reading uh, brought to us in a moment from the passage from which that is from. Um, last week, Alan um, gave uh, quite a lot of sections from the coronation in, in honor of our Platinum Jubilee Sunday. Um, there was a further thought that I wanted to share with you just before uh, we read uh, from God's Word. And these are the words that come to me every so often. I once I saw them written down. I think it was in the front of a Bible. And these are the words that were read to the Queen during the coronation service when a Bible was presented to her. We present you with this book, the most valuable thing this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. And these were the words that were proclaimed to the queen and that she takes seriously. And I think we, we talked about that, that last week as well. And the queen will often talk about her Christian faith, uh, particularly in her Christmas Day message. But I just want you to think about those words. We present you with this book, the most valuable thing this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. And these are the words that we pass down to our monarch on the coronation. Uh, that the monarch is, is not above God. That the monarch should listen to the words of God. And of all of the things that they may have in this world, the valuable things that they may, may have or be given or in past times be able to take the most valuable thing this world affords is the book that most of us will have here that will rest in many houses 
and will never be written. But we just trust as, as we hear the words from this book and as we read it t- today, we will hear God's wisdom coming through it. And I particularly like the last line because it calls it the lively oracles of God. Lively, full of life or living. This is not a dead book. This is the lively oracles of God, the living word of God that we're going to hear today and we're going to share together. So, um, David Suchet normally brings us our reading today, but I think most of you know that when I take the service, I interchange. We get David Suchet, but we also get a a hero of mine, which is Johnny Cash. So we're going to have Johnny Cash bring to us now uh, Matthew 7, verses 7 to 12, if you want to follow that. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, Do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Thank you. Now, I don't think we could have uh, a topic on uh, knocking the door should be open to you without um, playing a hymn, or in fact, sometimes I knew it as a Sunday school song, um, and many of you will will know this. So we're going to invite the music group up to share the first song with us. Oh, 
Thank you. Some very high parts in, uh, in that hymn there. Uh, if you're wondering, it was Simon leading us in the very high parts there. Um, but some good memories there. And I remember when we used to gather in here for Sunday school and we'd sing our, our Sunday school songs. Uh, and that was one of the, the frequent ones that we'd sing. Although when I looked at it again, I was amazed that it was, it was written in the, in the 1970s, that song. And we were still um, writing songs in ye and they and, and the language from probably the 1800s then. Um, so our passage, uh, again, we've been working through the Sermon on the Mount since October, and it's, it's coincidence in a way that, that this topic has, has fallen within it. We didn't plan it as such, but, but actually we are near the point when this passage will be reached anyway in our topic that we've been working through, as I say, since, since October. So I just want us to, to concentrate on this first part. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. I want us to, to consider this passage carefully because I think if you put those two together and you think no more about it and you don't think in context, it's really easy for this passage to, to lead us into error, into what we expect from prayer. And ultimately, it can lead us into disappointment when we think about that. And there's many passages of the Bible where if you just read the verse in isolation, you can come to the wrong conclusions. And I, I found this slide which uh, talked about another part of the Bible, but actually it can, it can really apply to this section here as to, as to, if you just read this glibly as to what you understand the meaning might be. The moral of Noah's Ark is that God wants you to have a yacht. And it's really easy sometimes to read passages and to read into that what you want to see, isn't it? You can read into that, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks the door will be opened. If you just read that as it is, there is not a caveat in sight. So it's important that we read around the, uh, the Bible and we read the context in which things are found. Now, if you believe that the moral of Noah's Ark is that God wants you to have a yacht, then please tell me if that comes true, and we'll see what happens. Okay. So, what's this passage telling us? Well, again, if we just put it into, into context here, you know, what Jesus is describing here in the Seven of the Mount, it comes, a, it comes a long way into the passage afterwards, so we've already had the Beatitudes, and we've had a number of the lessons um, that we've already heard about in past weeks, but... Jesus is talking here about talking to God, isn't he? He's bringing us back into um, us speaking to God. And it's a question there about God speaking back to us. And, and, you know, it's, a, it's a supplicant relationship there of asking for God and what we're expecting to receive back from God. And just before this passage, we have uh, the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus is teaching us how to pray so we read that passage a few weeks ago, Matthew 6, verse 5 to 14, and most of us um, will be able to, to reel off the Lord's Prayer quite easily. So we're in the context here of, of Jesus telling us a long uh, series of things about how our personal conduct should be, how we should deal with God, and what God gives to us and what we should expect from God. But it's a passage that is about talking to God and our expectations of him. And when I looked at this here, you know, it's easy to run those first three things together, isn't it? But there are three different active steps, and they require us to do different things sometimes. So to ask, to seek, and to knock. Now, I know my, my kids will frequently ask me for things. It's amazing when you go to, say, a theme park, uh, and then you make your way out to the shop. And when you're in the shop, they discover something that they must, they must, they must have that they didn't know about 15 seconds ago earlier. But kids are very good at the asking. So asking comes naturally to us, isn't it? We all ask. If we think about how we deal with people during the day, we either tend to tell them things, we might describe things, or we ask things. That comes fairly readily to us, to ask. Well, those second two made me think a little bit more, don't they? Can an ask can be an instantaneous thing. But to seek implies a little more that we should do of God sometimes. So... To seek might be sometimes that we wrestle with something, that what God wants us to do. And I've spoken here uh, a few times before about how God sometimes speaks to me and that sometimes I read a passage and I wrestle with it for a long time. Sometimes I don't know that I'm wrestling with it. It's a thought that comes to my mind periodically, sometimes over weeks, sometimes over months and occasionally over years until I reach what the answer might be. You might have your own way 
of seeking for things. You might um, find that, that you have a question, you need to go away and you speak to other people. You might need to spend time speaking with God about it, or you might need to spend time reading God's word to see if it be revealed to you. Now, I was a little more puzzled about knock. Does anyone have any ideas as to, to what God might be asking for with knock? open up opportunities I think so it implies to me that there's a barrier in the way doesn't it something has to be opened when you ask someone there's nothing in the way of a channel um, you know we might speak to somebody I've just asked you a question that you're all here able to to, to hear um, and to, to think about my question whether you're listening on YouTube or whether you're here in person but knock suggests that there is a barrier in the way and that is is part of the nub of, of the passage that we're going to think about but the other thing I want you to, to, to take away as well from this is they're all active steps that we're being encouraged to do there by Jesus but it's also a positive encouragement to do all of those things isn't it it's an invitation for us to do those things it tells us what we might get from it or what we will get from it but it actually positively asks us to do things ask seek knock it's not suggesting we should think about doing those things it's positively telling us and encouraging us to do so so if you've been to a guest service before, what you'll know is that uh, at this time, I stopped doing some work for a while, and I asked you to think about doing some work. So we've talked about the background and how we, we get here, and we talk about what the passage might be around. But I'd like us just to spend a few minutes on our tables discussing, um, do we get what we pray for? And depending on what your answer is, why or why not? So we're just going to spend, I think, probably uh, about three minutes so you've got about a minute and a half on the first one. I might extend that slightly. Actually, we'll give you two minutes for each of those questions. But do you get what you pray for? And then the second part, why or why not? Okay, go.
Okay, you've got about 30 seconds. Okay, coming, coming to a close, that's time for you. Time. Okay. Any takers for the first question? Do you get what you pray for? Go on, Linda. Okay, so what, well, what Linda said there, yeah, for those who, who are watching on YouTube, is that we shouldn't expect to get things immediately, but sometimes we get some nice surprises. Okay, I'm going to ask you later what those surprises are. Okay, anyone else? <laughs> okay, Jacob, okay. If it's something that's too hard to get, you might not get it. Again, we're definitely going to come back to that one later. Anyone else? It may not be God's timing, uh, Pat's just told us there. Okay, anything else? Oh, we can always trust in Margaret, can't we? So, Margaret, Margaret's answer there was, uh, he always answers, but sometimes the answer is no. Now, what I do want before we move on is, um, have, have, have people in the room received answers to prayer before? If you have, put your hand up. There we go. Have people in the room received what they've prayed for before? Yeah, okay. Has anyone received anything better than they prayed for? There we go, there we go. Right, well, let's spend a little bit of time to un unpack this here. Now, if Alan was taking this service, you'd have a lot of Hebrew and Greek. Now, I can't compete with Alan on Hebrew and Greek. Now, what you tend to get from me is occasionally you get a bit of classic art, uh, and you get a bit of archaeology and a bit of history. So you might get a little bit of that from me later. But what I'm going to do is I think it's probably, for me, it's best that we look at this through a few uh, Bible verses. There's two verses here, and I've deliberately put them side by side. James 4, verses 2 to 3, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And the second verse, Matthew 6, verse 11, uh, which we did just a few weeks ago. Give us today our daily bread. And we concentrate on this first one first. I was fascinated by that because I think it's really easy to jump ahead to the question of do we get what we already ask for? Now, what this verse is reminding us here is that sometimes we do not receive because we do not actually do the first bit, which is to, to ask. Now, I find there's many times that I... Although I say I trust in God, I will rush into a situation and it's only afterwards I think, have I prayed about that before? Have I asked for something first? And it's just so easy for us to do that and for us to actually forget to do the first bit that we're called to do. So you do not have because you do not ask God. Sometimes it can be as simple that we haven't actually involved God in the process. And if there's one thing you learn from Bethany, uh, it's the week after week will tell you that God wants you to be part of his kingdom and that God wants you to be in a relationship with him. And it would be like me making decisions in our house or Jillian making decisions in our house and us not consulting with each other and then finding that the other one isn't involved in the plan as we go along. So if we want God to be involved in something, the very basic thing, which probably is the thing that it is easiest to do, is to forget to actually involve God in the process. So... I didn't want us to miss this because it's a really obvious and easy point, but the easiest thing for us to forget to do. You do not have because you do not ask God. And the very basis of this uh, message here is that we should ask, we should seek, and that we should knock. And then we touched upon there, but whether we receive some of the things that we ask for. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And sometimes we ask for things and they're just not right for us, are they? As a child, I'd have prayed many times that I'd have been a famous footballer, uh, famous cricketer, rich. Many of these things that come into the heads of kids successful, all, all of these things, which I think we'd be wrong to say that we don't desire many of these things. But there's a difference between our desiring of things 
and our need for things, aren't they, and the right motives. But I also thought it was important that we put this verse behind it there as well, because when God gave us the model of praying in the, the Lord's Prayer that we use there, it's actually just a very prosaic line, isn't it? Give us today our daily bread. But I think if you find yourself between those two, it would be really easy to think that we shouldn't be praying for the fancy things and that we shouldn't be praying for things which might be individualistic to us or to other people. Because actually, God has different plans for each and every one of us, and it'd be really easy for us to just think we should be praying for just the basic things. But that is by no means what we're called to do. I think the second verse there displays that too. As Ephesians 3 verse 20, many of us will know, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us. So that verse is telling us there that we're not, God isn't limited in the things that we could pray for. And there will be people out there who it is important that God places in all levels of society. Um, our own queen, you know, we've talked about how she displays a faith, often a humble faith. Um, I'm sure the queen probably wouldn't be praying for many of the things that she has. Um, and I think that she's taken on board the words that she was given uh, with the Bible uh, at her coronation, and she looks to the royal wisdom. But God isn't telling us to, to limit our prayers to just our daily bread. And he tells us there that we have, I have plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And so the call there from that very first verse we looked at is what are our motives? What are we praying for? And Again, I say every week of Bethany, we talk about here the relationship that we are with God, isn't it? And the closer the relationship we have with God, the more we are in tune with him and what his wish for us is. And through that, I think many of us have talked in the past about how God has revealed his plans. And those plans sometimes are immeasurably more than we could have asked for. And there's many times of Bethany for individuals here and for, for Bethany as a church itself, the great things have happened here that we would have been limited in our imagination of what we'd be asking God for. So as we approach God, we should be looking at what our motives are for prayer. And there's many things that it's very obvious that um, our motives are for other people, and we might be looking to God. But again, it might not be what God has in plans for us because his plans are uh, immeasurably great. But also, he knows what his plans are for us. But our aim should be to be in tune with him. Now, you're going to get a little bit of history from me now at this point. Now, sometimes I show you uh, the, um, the archaeological site of, of a part of the Bible that we're, we're, we're talking about, where Paul spoke in Athens, we've covered before, or different sites where Jesus performed miracles. I just wanted to, to show you this. Does anyone know what this is? Uh, Jacob, I'm going to be amazed, but go ahead. A tomb? Mm, you could understand that to be a tomb. Okay, anyone else? N Nicole, right. I'm, I'm a bit concerned that the eight-year-olds are the only ones asking, uh, answering the questions here. Jay, uh, Nicole? A fireplace in a stony house. No. Any, any final guesses? <laughs> this is an historical building you've all have heard of. Okay, well, we're going to race through because as ever with the guest service, we are going to, going to overrun by a little while. This is at the Church of the Nativity. And this is called the Door of Humility. And it's one of the entrances to the building. Now, um, the historical reason the door is low is because when they were conquered, and um, what they didn't want is mounted Muslim soldiers entering the Church of the Nativity. So you had to dismount from your horse to enter. Now, for a modern man to be entering there, you also have to bend over to get in. So you have to enter the Church of the Nativity with your head bowed to God. And so it's become known as the door of humility. And I thought that was a great picture of how we should enter um, with our supplication to God, where we should ask, seek, knock. We should be bowing our heads in humility, uh, coming to the God who wants a relationship with us and is there uh, ready to answer our prayers. So that was, I, that was a wonderful picture for me, and I'm going to keep that. And you might see that in future, future services. Now, when I was looking for Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God, I actually came across uh, another hymn I'd never seen before, but it seems to be very, very popular, judging by the number of versions of this there are on the internet. So this is called Ask, Seek, and Knock, and I think it's a Hillsong song. But um, I just want you to, well, obviously, if you know this, you can sing along to it, but we'll stay seated and we'll watch, we'll watch the video. Yeah. I'm in my B-I-B-L-E And this is what it says 
says to me, tells me that I'm never, ever alone. I'm learning how J-S-U-S came down to earth and gave his best. Without a doubt, the best friend you'll ever know. Oh, God knows exactly what I need. So I remember this. Let's go. When you ask, he cares. When you seek, he's there. When you knock, 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 God opens up the door. When you ask, he cares. When you seek, he's there. When you knock, 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 God opens up the door. You When you ask, he cares. When you seek, he's there. When you knock, 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 God opens up the door. When you ask, he cares. When you seek, he's there. When you knock, 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 knock God opens Okay, so second part of our passage. Uh, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So we're going to concentrate on that passage in a minute. But it's traditional in these guest services for us to have a quiz. And I have an ulterior motive as well that I took a lot of sweets for my team at camp. And all of the other leaders had exactly the same idea so I have quite a lot of sweets to give away. My wife's a dentist, and we have to get them out of the house very quickly without feeding them all into my children. So we're going to have a very, very quick quiz. So if we read that passage, we're going to have our bread, snake, fish, and stone quiz. So if Jacob and Nicole want to come up, we have the bag of sweets to give away. Now, if you remember, we're going to give two. We're not going to throw at the people with the sweets. Okay. So, very quick quiz. I'm going to show you a series of slides, and on each of the slides would be um, either a person or a thing, which will be one of those four topics. So, you're welcome to shout out which one you think it is, whether it is bread, snake, fish, and stone. But the sweets are going to go for those who can identify what the thing is. So, we're going to start really easily with this. So, the very first one, when the snake stopped dancing. Okay, does anyone know what that is? Bread. Bread, okay. So that would be far too easy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the question now. For the sweets, can anyone name the, uh, the Boswell children? Can, name all of them. Okay, sorry. And hands up. Uh, Jan, can you? Okay, we'll see if we can name them all between us. Okay, first one. Joey one is one. Avalide, straight to the difficult one. Billy, Joey, we've had, okay, so, we, so we're, missing, we're missing the sensitive, intelligent one, I think. There is a Jack, yeah, we're missing the sensitive, intelligent one. Adrian, there we go. Okay, I think as Will fancied the last one, which was the most difficult one, he can have those. So that was Joey, Adrian, Jack, Aveline, and Billy, and that was a, a part of anyone on Merseyside's life through the 1980s, uh, followed the Boswell family. Okay, the second one. Is this a stone, rock, snake, or bread? Snake. Okay. Hands up for who that is? Black Adder. That was pretty much all of them, but we'll go for, for Margaret. I heard Margaret say that. Okay. Okay, next one. One of my favorites, this. Fish. Okay. Sign me for that. Who, who's the character? <laughs> 
Corporal Pike from Dad's Army. Okay, they're going to get slightly more difficult. The last two are going to be the most difficult. Slightly more. Okay. Stone. Who was that for a stone? Someone behind the stand. Was that Helen? Okay, that, that's Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones. And then the last two, this next one is Ruth Cushing here. She's the only person I've ever spoken to about Welsh rugby. <laughs> it's going to really put you to the test here, Ruth. So which one is this? Is this stone, rock, snake, or bread? Any takers? It's bread. Okay, who was... Brilliant. Brilliant, Mike. That's Sam Warburton, Welsh rugby player. Okay, over there. Not enough of you have been watching your rugby. Sorry, there's two more to go on here. And as we get towards the end, it's more and more likely that Tim will be the person who answers these questions. So this next one. Oh, it's, Tim's going for bread, but we'll see if anyone knows where it is before we have to give Tim the sweets, because it will really bother me to give Tim the sweets. Anyone know what it is? There we go. Right. Do you want to take them over, Jacob? Okay, and this final one, this final one. Snake. Snake. Again, it's going to really pain me if I have to give Tim the sweets for this. Does anyone know what this is? Daniel, I'll be so impressed if, this, if you get this. What was that, Daniel? A, a racing car. I think he can have some sweets for racing cars. Anyone know what this is? Go on, Tim. It's a Dodge Viper. Oh. Oh. So we are hoping to have a quiz later in the year, but we're just waiting for Tim to confirm when he's going on his next cruise, and then we'll be giving you the date after that. Okay, so we're going to invite the music group up now to share their, their second song with us. And if we're gonna, we'll stand when they're, when they're ready to go.
Thank you. I think we're probably going to finish about 10 past, allowing for starting a couple of minutes late, and, and to make sure that we include everything that we, we want to this morning. Now, that hymn we've just sung, This Is Amazing Grace, it was one that was sung quite a lot junior week, uh, just a week or so ago, uh, and it was amazing by the end of the week, the passion the kids were singing that song for. And again, that was another answer to prayer, uh, that the kids really participated in it and, and got involved in camp, and many of them actually proclaimed Jesus as their saviour by the end of that week. Okay then. Good and better gifts. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? We're going to spend a few minutes on, on table time in a minute, but I just want to, to bring a few things out from there. The first is that Jesus pulls no punches again, does he? Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, so uh, as we've been following through from October, there's a long passage there where Jesus was, was telling people that what they're doing was not what God wanted them to do, and he was saying how God wanted them to do things differently, and some of those things seem an impossible standard. And then about two-thirds of the way through, he tells them all that they're evil, though you are evil. And he's throwing that out to the rumors, and he's throwing that to everybody who he's speaking to there. So that is including everyone who's coming to him. So the crowds who are coming to listen, um, he'll have gathered a large gather, uh, group of followers who were there by that time. But to those who are listening, he, he's starting off by telling them, though you are evil. And he's talking about the gifts that he's given, and he's giving a comparison there between uh, the things that God might give, but also he's putting it into an analogy of, of the gifts that we might give every day. You know, as parents, you might not think of them as gifts, but you're looking after your children and you're giving them things constantly through the day, and we're answering, as before we talked about, the, the things that were asked for. So evil, gifts, and that comparison there, and the parent and the heavenly father. So I just want us to spend again a few minutes on table time before we, we unpack that. And the two questions I want you to think about, two of them are, are quite separate. Why does Jesus call them evil? Some of these people are coming, well, they're coming to listen to him and the followers of him there. There's some people who pay no attention to this. There'll be people who won't be coming to follow him. There'll be some within the crowd who are following to try and hear and trap him with things he said. But there's some people who would consider themselves to be very devout. Why does Jesus call them evil? And the second one was a question I said I'd come back to, to later. What good gifts has God given you? So I want us to spend about three minutes uh, thinking about that. Go. <laughs>
about 30 seconds. Okay then. Okay, we'll begin with the first one there. Why does Jesus call them evil? Okay, Nigel De Vere. So Nigel's a contrast between um, holiness and and unholiness. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Any thoughts on what evil is? We've had, we're all evil there. Okay, anyone else? God is good, we're all evil. In, in context. Okay, anyone else? I couldn't see who said that, sorry. Ruth. Ruth, we all fall short of God's standards. Again, good. We couldn't trust Ruth for the Welsh rugby, but we can trust her for verses, so that's excellent. Okay, anyone else? Acting differently from God's character from Simon there. That's all good. Okay. Uh, I think actually we'll come back to what good gifts God has given us in a minute because we, we've stumbled onto a couple of things there that I want to just talk about with the next slide. When I look at the Bible, the Bible talks about evil in a couple of different ways. The Bible talks about what our disposition to do is and the Bible also talks about evil as an act that we do and so a choice we continually make and the two of those are linked now i don't know if any of you are on social media but this is a lady who's quite prominent on it Catherine burble singh i don't know if anyone knows who she is did anyone watch the program the other the other week she she's known as britain's toughest head teacher i think strictest head mistress might be the might be the title for it but she's quite controversial with that but I think it's because sometimes her style can be a little abrasive, but actually I find that a lot of what she says is quite good sense. Now, I just want to put into context here that she's not a Christian. She's been quite clear that she's not a Christian, but she posted uh, this tweet, and this started off a very large debate, uh, and she took a lot of stick for it, but she stood by it. Um, her only regret is that she used the words original sin from it. But I think it's a very good, and I think as a, as a non-Christian, she stumbled across the essence of it here from studying children, what she, she's seen. Children need to be taught right from wrong and then habituated into choosing good over evil. And we talked there, and I think it was Ian said, about that we are, we are evil. Now, original sin talks about our, our predisposition, our, the Sin is a choice that we make to do, and it's evil, but we are predisposed to do that, and that is why we need saving from ourselves. Now, she's seen this in a, in a context, and I think any of you who have been parents will note this, that it's really easy if a child has done something wrong, um, when you ask them, have they done it wrong, even though you may have seen it, for them to say, no, I didn't do that. You know, our natural inclination is to do wrong, isn't it? And we, we continue that as adults, but our opportunity to do sin and to be evil expands um, from the little lies to terrible things that adults, adults sometimes do. So the Bible talks about evil uh, as, as a state uh, and as, as something that we, we choose to step into, but it's something we are habituated into doing. And I was fascinated by a non-Christian that she saw this, and, but also the second bit I was fascinated by was the massive reaction that she received to that, and that the, the world wants to believe that we are naturally good and that evil is something which happens to us or other people do. Whereas she stumbled onto the Bible principle here that our natural disposition is to do evil. And although we see that and we know it each in our lives, if you're not a Christian, you often don't want to believe that that is the case. But it doesn't take away the responsibility to do that because the Bible talks constantly about people choosing to do evil. It talks about evildoers. Um, it talks about, uh, frequently if you read the Old Testament, that Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, the Bible wouldn't be saying that if we were all just in a constant state of evil. 
that there is a choice to do that, that we constantly have the opportunity to do evil or to sin, and we choose to do that because we are habituated to it. So it's a natural state of affairs is to do that. So Jesus, when he was calling to all of those people, is describing our natural state of affairs and what we're habituated to there, which is to be evil, however good we might be, and there would be righteous, people who felt themselves to be righteous within that crowd, and others who would know that they were sinners coming to Jesus. But all of us, that is our natural state to be habituated to. But also, the reaction that, we, that she received there uh, with people refusing to believe it, I suspect is probably exactly the same one that Jesus would have received. And many from that crowd would have gone away thinking, I'm not evil, it's that person over there. That second one there, what good gifts has God given us? Can anyone think of one? Now, what I saw before was a lot of chatter, a lot of noise, and I had to cut through it there, but relatively few answers. What, what good things has God given us? Linda? Life. Life. There's a good one. Anyone else? Health. For some of us, not all of us are, are, are blessed with good health, but many, many of us are, and we've seen a Bethany many answers to prayer for health as well. I throw that in. Salvation. That's true, isn't it? The, of all the things that we be, be blessed for now. Yesterday, Charlie and, and Beck's wedding, I, I said before, it's probably the most explicitly Christian wedding I've ever been to, but all of the people, the, the parents who spoke, um, the, the, the couple, uh, the best man gave either words uh, from the Bible, or they talked about their own salvation and how that was the most important thing to them. And that, that is, but from the, any other good gift people want to talk about? The free NHS. The free NHS. Well, I, I, I think a number of people have different views on that. I'm going to say about the healthcare and modern medicine, the things that we've been able to receive through that. There's many things that God has enabled us to do as people and many things that we receive. And, and I always think back, and you hear me mention it quite often, so a few years ago we had our uh, year of testimonies where about 48 people gave their testimonies through the year of 46, 48, and the many amazing things that we'd seen happen in people's lives. And we might be ordinary people here at Bethany, but amongst us we've received many, many good gifts. But while we might give things to our children, and, and from the starting point that we while we're evil, we might seek to do good from that. Even Paul himself talks about the things that he knows he should do, he doesn't do, and the things he knows he shouldn't do, he does do. But from that, we must remember that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And that fascinated me as well, though, because often I think when I do wrong, or when I'm not feeling in a particularly good place, you worry about coming to God and I often think of him as a father figure who might be a bit angry at me but it talks about there being no variation or shadow due to change and I would be doing the very thing that I shouldn't be doing which would be steering clear away from God and only going to God when I feel virtuous. Jesus had these people coming to him um, who are acknowledged to be evil and that is the point of view that we should be coming uh, before us uh, to God. So our final passage, and I've toyed with this bit here because it, sometimes it feels as if it's a little bit of an add-on. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. And we just talked about um, giving to our children, and we talked about our relationship with, with God and asking God for things. But this is almost like a third wheel to this for me. And in some ways, it might seem to make perfect sense. But actually, when we look around us in the world... I don't think we can claim that people are treating each other as they would like to be treated themselves. Many people will uh, call grievance, but then treat other people in, in another way and not, not with that kindness. Now, we did an experiment once. I played in a football team. There was only about half Christians in the football team, and the others weren't. But we decided one, one day that when it wasn't our free kick or when it wasn't our throw-in or it wasn't our corner or it didn't go in, we weren't going to claim it. And we thought we'd see whether that caused a reaction in the other teams. Do you think it did or not? What I'd say is the referee thanked us quite a lot of times, but the other teams continued doing what they'd always done. So it would be easy to think if we do this that it would cause a good reaction in other people. Sometimes it might do, and we must have stood out as different teams. The referees thanked us quite frequently, so thank you for our honesty. But it didn't cause an obvious reaction in most of the teams that we played against. So we shouldn't think that this is an easy panacea and that everyone is going to come back and treat us like that. But it does tell us that we should do this nonetheless, doesn't it? And the second part of that is, 
you could just, if you read this passage in isolation, take it that this is something of the Bible, that we should just treat other people nicely. But to read it just in that context would just reduce us to a social gospel, and it would be really easy to do that, but it's most important that we don't do that. So I want you to read this uh, alongside a very similar passage later in Matthew, uh, when uh, Jesus was also summing up what the most important things were. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is, li is, it, is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So look to God first. And as the second, we should be acting out through that love of God. We should be treating others as we should be uh, wanting to be treated ourselves. Now, we were going to sing another him at this this time but i think time has has passed us passed us by now it, it would be a lovely hymn actually um everyone needs compassion so my apologies to the music group who will have practiced that and hopefully you can fit that in in another week but just as we speed towards a conclusion we began by by talking about um, knock jesus standing on the other side of the door and us knocking and making requests to jesus with there being a barrier between us and him Doors are talked about quite a bit in the Bible, and they're used in, in a number of the different analogies. I want to show you one where Jesus is on the other side of the door. We might have to speed through these. There we are. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is on the other side of that door. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. There is no caveats on that. We talked about the caveat before that we should be asking and seeking and knocking. Um, seeking to be within God's will and, and what his plan is for us and, and for, for the people we might be praying for. But here there are no caveats. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. He's not saying you knock on the door, I'll give you the, you know, I'll make a decision when you ask. I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Now, again, one of the great answers to the prayer that was given before uh, was about salvation. And that is open to each and every person who is here and who is listening, and those of our friends and family, and those we might go out and tell. But unless we tell people, how will, how will they know about that? So Jesus is there, and the picture is of him continually knocking and tapping on that door and waiting for us. And there's a second one that follows that, is for the end times, that this is a time-limited offer, isn't it? James 5, verse 9, behold, the judge is standing at the door. So whether we open that door to Jesus now, that door will be opened at some time. Uh, and that same Jesus who is opening it, is holding his hand out now as a friend, will be standing at that door. Somebody else who's standing at the door is our master chef, uh, Marion. Um, we're about to go out in a moment. Oh, she's done a runner now. Um, because we're going to join uh, for a social time outside for a buffet lunch. Now, uh, this was my image of what Marion's buffet lunches will be like. Ooh. Now... Uh, last week was the Platinum Jubilee, and this week um, is our Platinum Jubilee-themed social gathering at the back. I've had a little glance, and it was looking great. So we're just going to bow our heads now, and we're going to pray. And then I encourage as many of you as can uh, to stay behind, and we'll have a good time together. And for those of you on YouTube, I'm afraid you're going to have to go and make your own sandwiches after that. Okay, we'll just bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, for this, this passage that you brought to us today. We... We've talked about it a lot on our tables and we've shared amongst the group. Lord, we, we pray that you've spoken to us through that and we pray that, that we won't be shy to come and ask things of you, that we'll spend time seeking you and seeking what your will is for us, Lord. And when there's barriers there, that we'll, we'll knock on that door and keep asking. We thank you for the many great gifts that you've given us and we talked about some of those today. And I thank you for the, the great gift of uh, spending time with you and with uh, the campers last week on camp. And I thank you for uh, the 10 children who made commitments to you. And I know you live in celebrating the, in heaven. And I thank you for the prayers that have gone into that at Bethany. I thank you for uh, the wedding yesterday of Bex and Charlie. And we pray again that you'll, you'll bless the, their marriage. And we think of uh, the Gooding and the Clark families and friends as, as those funerals take place in a couple of weeks. And we pray that you'll be near to them through this time. Lord, as we, we gather for, for a social time afterwards, we thank you for the food that's been prepared uh, for us, and we pray that, that you'll bless that as we take it. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you all. Right. Before we head off, and hopefully now the, 